I love the Vimalakirti Sutra, and I'm aware that that um, because I get feedback from other people, some people find it impenetrable, or or um, somehow not. It, it's not they're not getting traction with it. So maybe if I share what it means to me, that'll help. I think that the Vimalakirti Sutra is a magical spell. And I, and I mean that literally. I believe in, in Buddha magic. Uh, John Lennon once said in an interview, um, I believe in magic. I'm an idiot. What are you going to do? All right. So whether I'm an idiot or not, I do believe in Buddha magic. And this sutra, especially the Burton Watson translation, which is the one I favor and recommend, reliably leads me into various states and experiences. So if you if you at least provisionally um, consider that maybe it was written that way, maybe whoever wrote it uh, said, uh, or consciously or unconsciously, did it in such a way that if you follow along with it, it takes you on a journey. <clears throat> it has been pointed out that... Uh, the sense of humor here in, in this sutra is rare, that you don't usually see a lot of humor in sutras, but this one has it. And so if you think maybe they're making a joke, they are. All right. Chapter one, Buddha lands. This is what I heard. At one time, the Buddha was in the Amra gardens in the city of Vaishali accompanied by a multitude of leading monks, numbering 8,000. There were also 32,000 bodhisattvas, all known to the assembly, persons who had carried out all the basic practices of great wisdom. Sustained by the might and supernatural powers of the Buddhas, they accepted and upheld the correct law in order to guard the citadel of the Dharma. They knew how to roar the lion's roar, and their fame resounded in the ten directions. All right. The ten directions, that's a thing that comes up in Mahayana uh, and presumably in other places within Buddhism. So what are the ten directions? I actually puzzled about this for a long time before I bothered to look it up, but it's pretty straightforward. Um, up, down. Um, left and right, backwards and forwards. I guess that gives you six. And then if you if you get the little in between directions, you got ten. So it's, it's pretty straightforward. Ten directions. Without waiting to be asked, they befriended others and brought them comfort. They ensured the continuance and prosperity of the three treasures, making certain that these never expired. They conquered and subdued the ill will of the devils and curbed the non-Buddhist doctrines. Look at the, the unapologetic evangelism here. They curbed the non-Buddhist doctrines. They are not um, hiding their agenda. <laughs> Buddhism is the way, according to this. All, this is all of these thousands and thousands of bodhisattvas and major disciples, all were spotless and pure, having long ago rid themselves of snares and obstructions. <clears throat> Their minds constantly resided in a state of unhindered emancipation. Their mindfulness, meditation, retention of the teachings, and eloquence never faltered, and of almsgiving, keeping of the precepts, forbearance, assiduousness, meditation, wisdom, and the power to employ expedient means, there was none they were not, there was none they were deficient in. As you're listening to this or reading it, the, I think the best approach is to just let it wash over you and, and trust that it's designed to take you on a journey. And you don't really even have to understand all of what's being said. 
just let it let it happen. They had learned to accept the fact that there is nothing to be grasped at, no view of phenomena to be entertained. There's no view of phenomena to be entertained. They knew how to respond compliantly to others and to turn the unregressing wheel of the law. Expert in comprehending the characteristics of phenomena, able to understand the capacities of living beings, they towered over the others of the great assembly and had learned to be fearful of nothing. With their merits and wisdom, they disciplined their minds. They adorned their bodies with auspicious signs, ranking foremost in aspect and form, but rejected all worldly embellishments. In fame and renown, they soared higher than Mount Sumeru. Their profound faith was diamond-like in its firmness. The jewels of their dharma shone everywhere, raining down sweet dew. And among the assembly, the sound of their words was the most subtle and wonderful of all. Interesting use of the word diamond-like here, uh, because this book, uh, this sutra is about from the first century AD, um, which predates the Vajrayana, the diamond vehicle. So um, they were already talking about a lot of the themes that you will be familiar with from Tibet and Vajrayana, for example, they were already present here in this older Mahayana. They had plumbed the depths of dependent origination and cut off all erroneous views, no longer entertaining the concepts either of being or non-being. In expounding the law, they were fearless as roaring lions, and their disquisitions on it rolled forth like thunder. There was no measuring them, for they had passed beyond measure. In seeking out the jewels of the Dharma, they were like practiced pilots at sea. In seeking out the jewels of the Dharma, they were like practiced pilots at sea. For me, this, this brings to mind um, a flexibility and a, and a willingness to trust your intuition in your own practice as you seek out the jewels of the Dharma. You're like a you're like a practice pilot at sea. <clears throat> they had mastered all the profound and subtle meanings of the doctrines and were expert in perceiving the past and future existences of living beings and the workings of their minds. They came close to equaling the freely exercised wisdom of the Buddha, the unparalleled one, his ten powers his fearlessness, and his 18 unshared properties. Though they had firmly closed the gate to all manner of evil existences, yet they allowed themselves to be born in the five lower realms, manifesting themselves here, uh, manifesting themselves there, so that they might act as great physician kings, adroitly healing the ills of others, doling out whatever medicine suited the ailment, and ensuring that the patient took it as prescribed. I'm going to repeat this, this little passage. Though they had firmly closed the gate to all manner of evil existences. Well, what does that mean? That means that um, just like in the old Buddhist frame, if you attain stream entry, uh, if you become a sotapan, you will no longer be reborn in the lower realms. That's one of the ways that stream entry is described. But check this out. Though they had firmly closed the gate to all manner of evil existences, yet they allowed themselves to be born in the five lower realms. Well, there are six realms. So what are the five lower realms? It's everything other than the God realm. 
in other words, the, according to this, this work, the human existence, the human realm, it's one of the lower realms. So they're setting a high bar here. They want you to, they want you to become a pure land Buddha. That's what, what this is leading toward. <clears throat> and what is a pure land Buddha? It is an enlightened Dewa or Brahma. You'll you will see in various places the um, which realms are are considered lower realms changes according to the author, but there according to this there are five, and you don't want to be in any of them. You don't want to be reborn in any of them, except that if you take the Bodhisattva vow, you are going to allow yourself to be reborn there. <clears throat> allow themselves to be born in the five lower realms, manifesting themselves there so that they might act as great physician kings. Very Mahayana. Countless benefits, all these they had acquired. Countless Buddha lands, all these they had made marvelously pure. No one saw or listened to them without profiting thereby, and no action of theirs was ever performed in vain. Such was the manner in which all merits adhered to them. Now, the next passage is a, is a list of the names of the bodhisattvas. It's a long list, and I'm going to read it. <clears throat> so kind of settle in and be patient and understand that each one of these names is a magical spell. And the the uh, the vibe from each of these names is meant to um, infuse you as you listen. The names of the bodhisattvas were bodhisattva viewing equality, bodhisattva viewing inequality, bodhisattva viewing equality and inequality, bodhisattva meditation freedom king. Bodhisattva Dharma Freedom King. Bodhisattva Dharma Forms. Bodhisattva Shining Forms. Bodhisattva Shining Adornment. Bodhisattva Great Adornment. Bodhisattva Jeweled Accumulation. Bodhisattva, accumulation of eloquence. Bodhisattva, jeweled hand. Bodhisattva, jeweled seal hand. Bodhisattva, constantly raised hand. Bodhisattva, constantly extended hand. Bodhisattva, constantly commiserating. Bodhisattva joyful capacity. Bodhisattva joyful king. Bodhisattva eloquent sound. Bodhisattva storehouse of emptiness. Bodhisattva holder of the jeweled torch. Bodhisattva jeweled valor. Bodhisattva jeweled view. Bodhisattva of Indra's net. Bodhisattva bright net. Bodhisattva unconditioned view. Bodhisattva wisdom accumulation. Bodhisattva jeweled supremacy. Bodhisattva heavenly king. Bodhisattva devil defeating. Bodhisattva lightning virtue, Bodhisattva freedom king, Bodhisattva merit forms and adornments, Bodhisattva lion's roar, Bodhisattva thunder sound, Bodhisattva mountain form smiting sound, Bodhisattva rutting elephant, Bodhisattva white rutting elephant, Bodhisattva constant exertion, Bodhisattva never resting, 
Bodhisattva wonderful birth. Bodhisattva flower adornment. Bodhisattva perceiver of the world's sounds. Bodhisattva gainer of great authority. Bodhisattva of Brahma's net. Bodhisattva jeweled staff. Bodhisattva unsurpassed. Bodhisattva adorned land. Bodhisattva golden locks. Bodhisattva gemmed locks. Bodhisattva Maitreya. And Bodhisattva Dharma Prince Manjushri. There were 32,000 Bodhisattvas such as these. In addition, there were other heavenly kings of great authority and power, as well as dragons, spirits, yakshas, gandharvas, asuras, garudas, kimnaras, mahuragas, and others, all come to take a seat in the assembly. Also arrived to take seats in the assembly were the various monks, nuns, laymen, and laywomen. So we have the inhabitants of all the six realms. Everyone has come to listen to the Buddha. <clears throat> At that time, the Buddha, reverently surrounded by this multitude of countless hundreds of, and thousands of beings, expounded the law for them. He was like Mount Sumeru, king of mountains, rising up out of the great sea. Resting at ease in his lion's seat, Clustered with jewels, he shed his radiance over all the great throng gathered there. Now, you can see, you, you get a feel for how this is being presented. They're painting a picture for you with all the, the colorful detail and the names of the bodhisattvas telling you who is there. Um, describing the magnificence of the Buddha in no uncertain terms. And as we listen to it and let it wash over us, it's already beginning to work its magical spell. We're entering into an alternate reality, a magical world. At that time, a man named Jeweled Accumulation, son of a wealthy man of the city of Vaishali, along with 500 other sons of wealthy men, had come to the place where the Buddha was, all of them bearing parasols adorned with the seven treasures. What are the seven treasures? Well, um, there's a list, uh, gold, silver, lapis, um, uh, coral, jade, kind of what you would think. What are our precious things that you could um, have a collection of all the seven treasures? So all of these, so jeweled accumulation and all of these other son, sons of wealthy men are carrying parasols adorned with the seven treasures. Bowing their heads in obeisance before the feet of the Buddha, they joined in offering their parasols as alms to the Buddha. The Buddha, with his supernatural powers, then caused all the jeweled parasols to come together and form one single parasol that spread over the entire thousand million fold world. All the vast features of that world were visible there in its midst. 
all the Mount Sumerus of the thousand million fold world, snow mountains, Muchalinda mountains, Maha Muchalinda mountains, fragrant mountains, jeweled mountains, gold mountains, black mountains, iron encircling mountains, great iron encircling mountains, the huge seas, the rivers and watercourses, brooks and streams, fountains and springs, as well as the suns, moons, stars, constellations, heavenly places, heavenly palaces, dragon palaces, and the palaces of the venerable spirits, all these were to be seen within the jeweled parasol. And the Buddhas of the Ten Directions, the Buddhas, as they preached the law, these two were visible within the jeweled parasol. They're giving us the instructions for seeing the Buddhas, all the Buddhas in the Ten Directions. They're inviting us into this magical world. At that time, all the members of the great assembly witnessing this manifestation of the Buddha's supernatural powers sighed in admiration at what they had never seen before. Pressing their palms together, they made obeisance to the Buddha, gazing up in reverence at the face of the honored one and never taking their eyes from it. Then the rich man's son, Jeweled Accumulation, in the presence of the Buddha, recited these, these verses of praise. Eyes pure and broad like the blue lotus, mind pure, steeped in meditations, for pure deeds long accumulated, boundless in fame. Your quietude guides the assembly. Thus, we bow our heads. Whenever I'm reading this, I find myself just bowing my head right here. I'm, I'm playing along. We have seen the great sage work miraculous transformations, showing us all the countless lands in 10 directions, the Buddhas expounding the law therein. Every one of these we have seen and heard. The Dharma King's Dharma powers surpass all other beings. Constantly, he bestows dharma riches on them all. Skillfully, he distinguishes the characteristics of phenomena, never faltering in his grasp of the one great truth. You have learned to treat all phenomena with freedom, so we bow our heads to this dharma king. You define things as neither existing nor not existing. Causes and conditions bring about their birth. No I, no doer, no recipient, yet good and bad karma never cease to function. Beneath the Buddha tree, you used your might to overpower the devil. Gaining the sweet dew of nirvana, you won your way to enlightenment. Already free of thought, perception, and volition, you refuted all the non-Buddhist doctrines. Three times you turned the wheel of the law in the thousand million fold world, the wheel, the, the wheel that from the first has always been pure. Heavenly and human beings gained the way. This was proof of it. The three treasures thereupon appeared in the world. Now here, uh, as opposed to the seven treasures, which are material things, the three treasures, as you know, are, are Buddha, uh, Dhamma, Sangha. This wonderful law brought rescue to the many beings. Embracing it, they never regress, but dwell in constant quietude. Embracing it, they never regress. This is a theme that I've heard uh, in various places within Buddhism. It's pretty consistent. Uh, I remember Upandita once saying, uh, once chuckling at a question from a student. Um, the question was, if you gain an insight knowledge, for example, would you um, 
would you lose it? And he chuckled and he said, you don't go backwards. So he, he's, he was adamant that you, you never regress. <clears throat> Great physician king, healer of old age, sickness, and death, we pay homage to the boundless virtue of your Dharma sea, unmoved by acclamation or abuse, like Mount Sumeru, you pity in equal measure the good and the not good. In mind and action impartial, like the empty sky, <clears throat> who can hark to this jewel of humankind, not give respectful assent? Now we offer these little parasols to the world honored one, and in them is revealed to us the 3,000 worlds. <clears throat> Palaces where gods, dragons, and spirits reside. Kimnaras, yakshas, and all those other beings. Everything that exists in the world we see. The 10-powered one in pity manifest these transformations. Now this word pity, uh, some of us uh, might rankle a little bit of, about uh, by that word because it sometimes connotes kind of something um, uh, that isn't considered nice. But, but here I think pity is actually um, standing in for uh, metta or, or karuna, compassion perhaps. Just a translation, and, and this points up something important. Translations are just translations, which means they're they're a matter of opinion, and different translators will translate words in a way that makes sense to them. And so we want to leave some latitude for that. The assembly, seeing this rare sight, all praise the Buddha. Now we bow our heads to the venerable one of the threefold world. Great sage, Dharma king, refuge of the multitude, viewing the Buddha with purified mind, none who do not rejoice. Uh, as you know, your body is really important uh, in, in everything. And so it's, this practice is not not just a mental affair so when you bow your heads and when they when they repeat over and over again thus we bow our heads and find yourself nodding along that's doing something that's part of the magical spell <clears throat> each sees the world honored one standing right before him such are the buddha's transcendent powers his unshared properties the buddha preaches the law with a single voice but each living being understands it according to his kind. All believe the world honored one speaks the same words to all. Such are his transcendental powers, his unshared properties. The Buddha preaches the law with a single voice, but each living being understands it in his own way. All undertake the Buddha's practices and gain profit thereby. Such are his transcendental powers, his unshared properties. The Buddha preaches the law with a single voice, but to some it brings fear, to others delight and joy. When the rich man's son, Jeweled Accumulation, had finished reciting these, these verses, he addressed the Buddha saying, world honored one, these 500 sons of rich men have all set their minds on Anuttara, Samyak Sambodhi. They wish to hear how one can purify the Buddha lands. We beg the world honored one to explain the practices carried out by bodhisattvas in purifying the Buddha lands. Okay, now here for the first time we've been inter introduced to this, this magic word, Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, which means uh, supreme perfect enlightenment. You can take that phrase, that phrase, Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, as a as a mantra or a, or a magical spell. And here again, because I believe in Buddha magic, I think it has great power. 
I think it's a, it's kind of a virus. It's a Buddha virus. To even hear the phrase is remarkably fortunate in any lifetime. Anutra Samak Sambodhi. To say it aloud, oh, now you're you're infest, you're infected with the Buddha virus, and you won't be satisfied with anything less than supreme perfect enlightenment. Whatever that means, we don't even have to know what it means yet. Mm. There's a note here about purifying the Buddha lands. To purify the Buddha lands here means to work diligently to lead the beings of various realms or Buddha lands to enlightenment, which is one of the chief aims of the Bodhisattva's activities. It's worth taking a moment here to, to take stock. Is the, is the magical spell doing its work? For me, it is. I can feel myself transitioning into this magical world of, of perfect Buddhas and <clears throat> um, compassionate and also fierce bodhisattvas. Bodhisattva devil defeating. That's a cool thing that uh, we don't always allow for within Buddhism, that, that there is this aspect of um, not taking any crap from Mara and his minions. Devil defeating. Let's just take a minute to sit quietly and meditate together. Imagine all of the dragons, spirits, yakshas, gandharvas, asuras, garudas, kimnaras, maharagas, all gathered around. Reach out with your tendrils of magical perception and see if you can feel them. They're all clustered around to hear the Buddha. All right, I'd like to go on to a to a, a different um, phase here within the within the sutra. <clears throat> Throughout this work, Shariputra, who, as you know, is the Buddha's lead lead disciple, is used as the straight man. Uh, so he's the he's the butt of of everybody's jokes, and he's uh, always asking the dumb question that that any normal person would ask, but. He ends up looking like a fool, um, but that's okay. And if you think of it from the point of view of, of Shariputra himself, um, he's a bodhisattva. So if if by playing the fool, he can teach us something, I, I imagine he'd be more than happy to accept that role for a short time. 
<clears throat> so after uh, the rich man's son, Joel accumulation um, asked the question of the Buddha how to acquire a Buddha land. The uh, the Buddha preaches a little bit um, about when the mind is pure, the Buddha land will be pure. So this next part is is a reference to that. At that time, Shariputra, moved by the Buddha's supernatural powers, thought to himself. If the mind of the Bodhisattva is pure, then his Buddha land will be pure. Now, when our world honored one first determined to become a Bodhisattva, surely his intentions were pure. Why then is this Buddha land so filled with impurities? That's a pr pretty good question. The Buddha, knowing his thoughts, said to him, what do you think? Are the sun and the moon impure? Is that why the blind man fails to see them? Shariputra replied, no, world-honored one. That is the fault of the blind man. The sun and the moon are not to blame. Shariputra, it is the failings of living beings that prevent them from seeing the marvelous purity of the land of the Buddha, the thus come one. The thus come one is not to blame. Shariputra, this land of mine is pure, but you fail to see it. At that time, one of the Brahma kings with his conch-shaped tuft of hair said to Shariputra, you must not think that this Buddha land is impure. Why do I say this? Because to my eyes, Shakyamuni, Shakyamuni's Buddha land is as pure and spotless as the palace of the heavenly being great freedom. Shariputra said, when I look at this land, I see it full of knolls and hollows, thorny underbrush, sand and gravel, dirt, rocks, many mountains, filth and defilement. <clears throat> the Brahma king said, it is just that your mind has highs and lows and does not rest on Buddha wisdom. <clears throat> Therefore, you see this land as impure. Shariputra, the Bodhisattva treats all things and beings, each one of them with perfect equality. His deeply searching mind is pure. And because it rests on Buddha wisdom, it can see the purity of this Buddha land. <clears throat> the Buddha then pressed his toe against the earth and immediately the thousand million fold world was adorned with hundreds and thousands of rare jewels till it resembled jeweled adornment Buddha's jeweled adornment land of immeasurable blessings. <clears throat> all the members of the great assembly sighed in wonder at what they had never seen before and all saw that they themselves were seated on jeweled lotuses. The Buddha said to Shariputra, now do you see the marvelous purity of this Buddha land? Shariputra replied, indeed I do, world-honored one, something I have never seen before and never even heard of. Now all the marvelous purity of the Buddha land is visible before me. The Buddha said to Shariputra, my Buddha land has always been pure like this, but because I wish to save those persons who are lowly and inferior, I make it seem an impure land full of defilements. That is all. It is like the case of heavenly beings. All take their food from the same precious vessel, but the food looks different for each one, depending upon the merits and virtues that each possesses. <clears throat> it is the same in this case, Shariputra. If a person's mind is pure, then he will see the wonderful blessings that adorn this land. This is something you know in your own experience, in, in your moments of, of, uh, of peace, in your meditation, when everything is just fine as it is, just perfect. Your mind is pure and everything around you is pure. 
it's just in our moments of being all roiled up that we perceive the problems. <clears throat> when the Buddha, <clears throat> when the Buddha in this way revealed the marvelous purity of the land, the 500 sons of rich men who accompanied jeweled accumulation, all were able to grasp the truth of birthlessness and 84,000 persons all set their minds on attaining Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi. The Buddha then released the supernatural power that he had exercised with his toe, and the world returned to its former appearance. <clears throat> 32,000 heavenly and human beings who wish to pursue the path of the voice hearer, understanding that all things are impermanent in nature, cast off the dust, remove themselves from defilement, and attain the pure dharma eye. And 8,000 monks, ceasing to accept the phenomenal world, put an end to all outflows and gained emancipation of mind. This is a theme throughout the sutra that after each chapter, after the wisdom is preached, some number of, of beings will be liberated in, in, um, in some capacity, maybe all the way, or maybe they just gained the Dharma eye. There's an interesting thing here. There are all these numbers. Um, I think they're not random. For example, let's see. 32,000 heavenly and human beings who wish to pursue the path of the of the voice here, etc. Well, 32,000 is the number of nadis, uh, the channels in, in the body, according to uh, the tradition. It, and I think that, that that's a really uh, that's a really useful model. Uh, if you consider that I, I, for, uh, if if this body is being instantiated in real time from something deeper, something energetic, well, it's the it's the thirty two thousand nadis in various configurations that create our experience. <clears throat> and if you were to do a back of the envelope calculation, you'd find that thirty two thousand little channels in various combinations, it's a, it's an unimaginably large number. It will be much larger than the number of atoms in the universe. So, so you can imagine um, anything, any experience, any shape, any situation could be manifested by different combinations of these nadis. As you read the, the Vimalakirti or listen to it, you can uh, imagine that you feel yourself uh, being liberated a little bit at a time uh, with each one of these uh, chapters, letting go of defilements. <clears throat> I want to cut ahead to a uh, chapter called Beyond Comprehension. And I want to look at one of my favorite characters, which is the goddess. So um, bear with me for a moment while I find this. All right, so in this chapter, uh, Vimalakirti, who, uh, who is a layman and, and highly enlightened, is pretending to be sick uh, so that the, the various bodhisattvas and disciples will come to visit him, and they do. And they, 
they all man uh, magically manage to fit into his small unadorned sick room where it's just Vimla Kirti lying alone on, on his bed. And Vimla Kirti preaches a Dharma to them and he uh, engages in dialogue with Manjushri uh, and they together they preach the Dharma. Now, just after one of these exchanges, At that time, there was a heavenly being, a goddess in Vimalakirti's room, who seeing these great men and hearing them expound the law, proceeded to make herself visible and taking heavenly flowers, scattered them over the bodhisattvas and major disciples. When the flowers touched the bodhisattvas, they all fell to the floor at once. But when they touched the major disciples, they stuck to them and did not fall off. The disciples all tried to shake off the flowers through their supernatural powers, but they could not do so. Now, here, they're making a clear distinction between the bodhisattvas, who are the, you know, the best of the best, according to this, and the major disciples. They're, um, this sutra likes to take shots at early, earlier Buddhism. The, the monks are limited in their scope. Uh, compared to the bodhisattvas, as understood here. <clears throat> At that time, the goddess said to Shariputra, uh, who of course is a major disciple, why try to brush off the flowers? Such flowers are not in accordance with the law, he replied. That is why I try to brush them off. <clears throat> the god, <clears throat> excuse me, the goddess said, don't say these flowers are not in accordance with the law. Why? Because the flowers make no such distinctions. You in your thinking have made up these distinctions. That's all. If one has left the household life to follow the Buddha's law, make such distinctions. That is not in accordance with the law. <clears throat> one must be without distinctions to be in accordance with the law. Look at the bodhisattvas. The flowers do not stick to them because they have already cut off all thought of distinctions. Just as evil spirits are able to take advantage of a person who is beset by fear, so because you disciples are fearful of the cycle of birth and death, the senses of form, sound, smell, taste, and touch are able to take advantage of you. But once a person has done away with fear, then the five desires that arise from these senses will not be able to get at him. So long as one has not done away with all such entanglements, the flowers will stick to him, but they will not stick to someone who has eliminated them all. <clears throat> okay, so that's pretty clear. Um, she's saying that the major disciples have some work to do. They should become bodhisattvas and not be so smug in their voice hearer um, understandings. <clears throat> now, as usual, uh, Shariputra, he, he's just received this profound teaching, but he, he doesn't get it. So, so what does he say? Well, the very next thing he says, she just says, uh, the goddess has just said, but they will not stick to someone who has eliminated them all. Shariputra said, goddess, have you been staying in this room long? It's like it's a total non sequitur. <laughs> but it gives her another opportunity to teach him. And she replied, venerable sir, my stay in this room is about as long as your attainment of emancipation. Shariputra said, so you've been here a long time? Venerable sir, said the goddess, how long has your attainment of emancipation been? Shariputra was silent and did not answer. The goddess said, with your great wisdom, venerable sir, why do you remain silent? Shariputra replied, emancipation cannot be spoken of in words. Therefore, I do not know what I can say to you. The goddess said, words, writing, all are marks of emancipation. Why? Because emancipation is not internal, not external, and not in between. 
And words likewise are not internal, not external, and not in between. Therefore, Shariputra, you can speak of emancipation without putting words aside. Why? Because all things that exist are marks of emancipation. I think this is really well done. It's pretty clear that the goddess has a, has a level of freedom far beyond the, the brittleness of Shariputra. <clears throat> Shariputra said, doesn't emancipation mean putting aside lewdness, anger, and stupidity? The goddess said, the Buddha, addressing persons of overbearing arrogance, asserted that one must put aside lewdness, anger, and stupidity in order to mean to gain emancipation. That is all. If he was addressing those who were free from overbearing arrogance, the Buddha asserted that the nature of lewdness, anger, and stupidity is emancipation itself. Now, this to his credit, Shariputra replied, Excellent, excellent. Goddess, what have you seized on? What have you seen into that you speak with such eloquence? The goddess replied, I have seized on nothing seen into nothing, and hence speak with eloquence. Why? If one claims to have seized on something or seen into something, then in the light of the Buddha's law, one is being overbearingly arrogant. <clears throat> Shariputra asked the goddess, of the three vehicles, which do you pursue? The goddess replied, I use the law of the voice hearer to convert living beings, and therefore I practice the way of the voice hearer. I use the law of causes and conditions to convert living beings, and therefore I practice the way of the Pacheka Buddha. I use the law of great pity to convert living beings, and therefore I practice the great vehicle. Shariputra, when one enters a grove of champak trees, one smells only the odor of the champak and does not smell any other odor. And in the same way, when one enters this room, one smells only the fragrance of the Buddha blessings, but takes no delight in smelling the fragrance of the voice hearers or the Pacheka Buddha's blessings. Uh, you notice a, a moment ago, I said that this book predates uh, Vajrayana uh, Buddhism, which it does. Um, so we're... Uh, in modern times, as students of Buddhism, we understand the three vehicles to be um, the uh, Theravada uh, initially, and then the Mahayana, and then the Vajrayana. That's, I think, pretty common, un common understanding. But they're already talking about the three vehicles and they don't have a Vajrayana. So what are they talking about? They're talking about the way of the voice hearer, which is old Buddhism, early Buddhism, the way of the Pacheka Buddha as the second vehicle and the Mahayana as the third. <clears throat> I find this really interesting to, to understand this history because if you didn't know this, um, you might think that, that uh, Vajrayana, in, in particular Tibetans, um, created a bunch of stuff that was actually already there, well, long before they showed up, long before that school evolved. Now, toward the end of this passage, Vimalakirti gives a little bit of commentary on the goddess, which I find really interesting. Okay. At this time, Vimalakirti said to Shariputra, this goddess has in the past made offerings to 92 million Buddhas and can disport herself with the supernatural powers of a bodhisattva. 
She has fulfilled all that she vowed, has accepted the truth of birthlessness, and dwells in a state from which she will never regress. Because of her original vow, she can show herself anytime she wishes and teach the and teach and convert living beings. So the way I read this, the goddess is a Buddha. Um, and it's saying here that she's able to uh, manifest herself as whatever she wants in order to teach and convert living beings, which is what she did. She was, um, she somehow lives in Vimalakirti's room, but um, she made herself visible in the form of a goddess. And in fact, I want to I want to uh, share with you uh, another interesting thing: an exchange between the goddess and Triputra. Shariputra said, why don't you change out of this female body? Okay, so this is another non sequitur. The goddess has just preached some profound dharma to uh, Shariputra. It totally goes over his head or he ignores it and says some this. Why don't you change out of this female body? Um, the goddess replied, for the past 12 years, I've been trying to take on female form but in the end with no success. What is there to change? If a sorcerer were to conjure up a phantom woman and then someone asked her why she didn't change out of her female body, would that be any kind of reasonable question? No, said Shariputra. Phantoms have no fixed form, so what would there be to change? The goddess said, all things are just the same. They have no fixed form. So why ask why I don't change out of my female form? At that time, the goddess employed her supernatural powers to change Shariputra into a goddess like herself, while she took on Shariputra's form. Then she asks, why don't you change out of this female body? Shariputra, now in the form of a goddess, replied, I don't know why I have suddenly changed and taken on a female body. The goddess said, Shariputra, if you can change out of this female body, then all women can change likewise. Shariputra, who is not a woman, appears in a woman's body. And, and the same is true of all women. Though they appear in women's bodies, they are not women. Therefore, the Buddha teaches that all phenomena are neither male nor female. Then the goddess withdrew her supernatural powers and Shariputra returned to his original form. The goddess said to Shariputra, where now is the form and shape of your female body? Shariputra said, the form and shape of my female body do, does not exist and yet does not not exist. The goddess said, all things are just like that. They do not exist, yet do not not exist. And that they do not exist, yet do not not exist is exactly what the Buddha teaches. So here, there's there's more subtle humor there in that uh, the goddess said to Shariputra for the past, I don't know, however, 20 years or something, I've been trying to take on female form, but in the, in the end with no success. Well, she's standing right there in a female form. And then and not only does she have the ability to do that, she has the supernatural ability, power ability to change Shariputra into a, a female and then back again. At the in the very at the very end of the of the Vimalakirti Sutra, Ananda, who is uh, remembering this, says to the Buddha, "What should this sutra be called?" And the Buddha says, uh, "It should be called um, this uh, the sutra on the expositions of Vimalakirti." 
And another name for it is the doctrine of the emancipation beyond comprehension. So the emancipation beyond comprehension is the major theme of the sutra. And the goddess is the one who best shows us what that looks like. Uh, she has, through her practice, has made her home base um, the bardo, the bardo unborn. This is why I say the goddess is a Buddha, because she, her, she hangs out as Dharmakaya. And from that place of the bardo unborn, she can then instantiate as whatever. And that's what is being recommended throughout the book. You should gain the emancipation beyond comprehension, which is Anutra Samyak Sambodhi.